Welcome this afternoon to this George Knight's Memorial um, Lecture. My name is Richard Rickett. I'm co-editor of Beecraft. Beecraft is the sponsor of uh, this lecture today. Uh, in case you're wondering, George Knight was quite a prominent beekeeper in his day. Uh, he was born on a dairy farm near London and uh, at the age of 14 he joined the British Army and uh, became a member of the Royal Horse Artillery. And in his early 20s he was involved with the uh, evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force from Dunkirk and was later involved in the D-Day landings and the subsequent campaigns of the Second World War. Um, he retired as a Sergeant Major uh, to take up his hobby of beekeeping. And he channeled his uh, military experience and his um, ability to command into the hobby of beekeeping, eventually becoming the president of the British Beekeepers Association and the organiser of, of this spring uh, convention. He died in 1998, and his obituaries universally uh, praised him, but they didn't um, shy away from using words like strong-willed, difficult, inconsistent, um, and, and dynamic. And as someone who's uh, served my own fair share of time on various um, beekeeping committees, um, I think I might venture to say that these are all characteristics which are quite often found <laughs> in those that like to organise beekeeping <laughs> events and associations. Um, but the thing about Knights was he was clearly a great character. And one of the things I love about being involved in beekeeping and editing a beekeeping magazine is that other than the bees, beekeeping is very much about the people and the history of beekeeping is peppered with really great characters. And one of those characters is what we're here to hear about uh, today, of course, is, is Charles Butler. And I won't tell you very much about him because that's Chris's um, job, but um, he was someone who 400 years ago, of course, wrote the feminine monarchy, and he was what you would call a polymath. He was interested in many things, uh, as well as being a country parson. He was a theologian, a musicologist. He wrote music, a grammarian, a spelling reformer. Uh, and by all accounts, quite a shrewd businessman as well, which I think probably Chris is going to um, mention. So a great beekeeping character. And I can't really think of a better person to talk to us today um, than Chris, who I've known for probably more than a decade. I've visited him at his charming um, plot quite a few times now, I think. Um, and he's undoubtedly one of the great characters of contemporary beekeeping. I hope he won't mind me saying that. And he's himself a polymath, um, expert in all sorts of things. He's a storyteller. A writer, um, is an expert in ancient crafts, um, you're a folk musician, um, an apitherapist, a skep maker, a skep beekeeper. He lives in a skep, his house is made of straw, <laughs> his own straw house, which is a charming place to visit. He's a practicing druid and, um, and he makes mead. And I'm smiling at this point because I know what's coming. <laughs> I can attest to the fact that he, he makes very wholesome and delicious mead, which I've had on quite a few occasions, I think I can remember. Um, and just one last little peep into the character of Chris, which I think is amusing. A few years ago, he built a coracle. He made it out of wicker and horse's hide and put it into the first spot of the Thames where there was any water near its source and sailed what was really just a floating slipper 190 miles down the Thames um, to the sea. And last time I was at Chris's, he was showing me uh, a huge oak log, which he's slowly chipping away at and making into a canoe that I think we're going to repeat the journey at some point. You know, I'm, I'm hoping there's room for two on there. If I had enough need, I might, um, <laughs> might join you. So without any further ado, I shall hand over to Chris and what might be the highlights of yeah. his <laughs> talk. Yeah. And we're looking forward to hearing about Charles Butler. Thank you, Richard. Uh, please take a plastic, small plastic Thank cup. You and uh, I just want to make a libation. Uh, for uh, gratitude for George Wither and for Beecraft and for the BBKA, uh, but of course Charles Butler and what he called the, the Muses Birds and the Bees themselves. Thank you. Cheers. So to Charles Butler. Sure. So this, this is the first time I have uh, made this lecture because it's pretty niche and nerdy, isn't it? And uh, I'm glad that you're niche and nerdy enough to be here to appreciate it. So Reverend Charles Butler, born in 1571, died in 1647, is known as the father of English beekeeping. That's quite a title, isn't it? And who's the mother of English beekeeping, I wonder? 
And so with that comes this whole equality, uh, the feminine monarchy and the father of English speaking. There's a whole kind of mother and father uh, sexes thing arising, isn't there? Just, just from the onset. At the beginning of his book, he first published it in 1609, actually. And then it was quite a small edition. And in 1623, he made it bigger and better with more observations and a preface to the reader and all sorts of poetry that other people added. And of course, right at the heart of the book was a, a piece of music that he expanded on and composed for bees. And there's quite a lot of Latin in the book. He was a, a reverend. And he, I guess he just expected everybody to know Latin, or anybody that could read, could read Latin. So as soon as you enter the book, you realise, oh gosh, what's he, you know, he's quoting Pliny and Virgil and Aristotle and all these people, but he's not translating it into English. He's just leaving it as Latin, you have to kind of squirrel in there and figure out what it means. And this is at the beginning of the book, Solertia e labore, sagacity and work. And for idleness, we atone. So he's coming with a, a kind of religious teaching as well. And what I love about him and his work is he, this is like a practical book on beekeeping. But all the way through it's strewn with, with folklore and he's, sta you know, he's standing on the shoulders of giants like these ancient writers. But also he's, he's kind of you know, saying, well, you know, that's not true. They didn't, they didn't look carefully enough. Actually, it's not a king, it's a queen. And, you know, the drones do this and they don't do that. So he's... He's kind of, uh, from his practical knowledge, he's rewriting what everybody else just parrot fashion uh, wrote about bees at his time. There was one book that kind of picked the post in the English language, but it was a small booklet, really. So here we are, here we are at the beginning again. They're wonderful houses built with wonderful art, royal treasures stored within them by skill and labor, all are made. Interestingly, you know, I would call this a skep, wouldn't you? This is a skep, isn't it? He, he doesn't use the word skep at all in the book, in the feminine monarchy. He uses the word hive. And every now and again, a Latin word, alveria or alveri. <coughs> These are the three editions, uh, the three main editions. The first one is really like a tiny booklet. And then the middle one is the one we're celebrating this year, its 400th anniversary of the 1623 edition. And then he published some others a bit later on. He was, he was a language reformist, Charles Butler. He wanted the English language to be spoken, to be written as it sounded. So his, uh, his later editions, it's difficult to read anyway, because all the S's look like F's, you know, and it's lots of this, thus, that, and doth this, and do that. And uh, luckily, a man called John Owen translated it into English or translated it, most of it into English and has published it. And you can buy this book in its original format over in the trade stand, and you can also buy John Owen's book uh, also today, if, if you wish. But what John Owen did, left out was all of the Latin, and I don't know why. I'm just learning to translate Latin, and it's, a, it's quite an art, actually. There's so many different ways it can be translated. And the, uh, I just want to add a bit of historical and feminist context because we're talking about the feminine monarchy. 400 years ago, uh, did feminism even exist? I mean, not academically it didn't, I suppose behaviorally it must have done. Uh, so we're looking at religion as well, and we're looking at the monarchy. So this is the feminine monarchy, and the head of the church, uh, the English church, in the Acts of Supremacy, uh, became, the, the monarch became the head of the church. So instead of Rome, uh, the Pope being the head of the church. Just as Charles Butler, we know, was the twinkling in the eyes of his parents was happening, where they were courting. And there, these powerful women are on the throne and battling out, you know, Queen Elizabeth I and Queen Mary of Scots. So there's these two powerful feminine figures um, f fighting for the throne. And he grew up amongst all of this. And then he was born in High Wycombe. I went to school in High Wycombe. Interestingly, I've only just realised, but interestingly, I shook my first swarm of bees into a skep in 2009, and 400 years after he first published uh, The Feminine Monarchy. And, uh, so, 1570, just before he was born, uh, there was a plot to replace Queen Elizabeth. 
uh, the, the largest witch trials in history happened you know, when he was like, um, you know, sort of 10 and 11 and 12 over in France. And it's like we made the press. And he, he was an avid reader, of course, he became a writer. He was a chorister and he ended up at Magdalen College in Oxford. And of course, the witch trials, you know, they did, they did you know, string up and burn a few men, but it was mostly women. So there's a whole uh, oppression of the feminine happening all around him at the same time as these great queens rising up and fighting. Shakespeare uh, was, was working, he was a contemporary with him, and publishing. And in 1586, a guy called Luis Mendez de Torres named the big bee in the middle as a maesa, as a female bee, as a mistress madam in the middle. And then the Bad Babington plot, which led to Queen Mary of Scots being imprisoned and eventually beheaded. Spanish Armada came over, so all this is going on. <laughs> all this is going on. Uh, the witch trials began in Britain, up in Scotland. Uh, so much oppression of women. And, uh, and then 1593, Edmund Southern wrote the first book solely dedicated to beekeeping in the English language. There were editions and, of books and writing in books of natural history before that, but he penned the first book in the English language, and it's quite small, and I'm sure Charles Butler read it, and again, it's, it, it sells itself as being a, a book written from practical knowledge. Uh, the Nine Years' War in Ireland, and then Butler begins to start publishing. And the, log the Logic of Ramus, a book about logic and, and you know, writing. King James uh, of Scotland became King James of you know, Britain. And he published a book called Demonology, which again was oppressing the feminine and you know, killing midwives and, and all sorts of strong women within the community were, were killed, you know, thousands and thousands. So it's really interesting we get this, you know, amongst this, this, all of this oppression of the female, we have this humble little, humble little pastor in Hampshire just dropping in this little kind of blessing of, of, of the feminine monarchy and something that really celebrates the, you know, that this kind of dot in the middle of the yin-yang, if you like. <laughs> the bubonic plague breaks out and then there's a the gunpowder plot and in 1609 the first edition is published. And then King James, you know, after he published his book, Demonology, you know, this is the King James Bible comes along. Shakespeare died, 1623, uh, the feminine monarchy, uh, the second edition, the bigger, better, most glorious, magnificent edition uh, is published. Uh, and um, whilst over in Spain, uh, by this humble beekeeping reverend, whilst over in Spain, uh, Philip, the fourth had bigger fish to fry and he closed all the brothels in Spain were kind of, you know, officially closed uh, by him and, and banned. And, you know, that was big business and that was women's sort of uh, power as well in a way. So a lot of oppression was happening at this time. And James I was particularly paranoid. He, uh, he nearly drowned, him and his wife nearly drowned uh, coming back from Denmark. And he thought it was witchcraft because a great storm rose around them. And when the Armada was repelled, you know, the, the, the folklore, everybody was talking that it was, it was British witches that were cursing and raising these storms. So he was a particularly paranoid king, but then he died. Charles came to the throne and, you know, and he, uh, you know, he abolished Parliament. <laughs> Interesting time in history. And then the third edition was celebrating Henrietta Maria of France, who was the Queen Consort of Charles, and it's a, I haven't read the third edition, but it looks even more kind of coded with funny language than the first edition. And then Butler goes on to publish the principles of music and, uh, and a treatise on marriage between first cousins, just telling us all the wisdom of uh, inheritance and things like that, I'm not quite sure. I haven't read that one either. What makes the book bigger and perhaps more interesting is a preface to the reader where he, he's quoting Virgil and calling the bees the muses birds. And he's telling us you know, the, the, uh, how all throughout the writing before him, people were calling the big bee in the middle Rex and, uh, and how he's going to call it the, the queen. 
and, the, and extolling the virtues of this Amazonian feminine kingdom. And then more Latin, which, which I've, I've tried to put in here, what I haven't found other people sort of raising up. And maybe there's a Beecraft article here to, to, find, you know, to find and to decode all the Latin in, in the feminine monarchy and, and make an article out of it. So, so to the author, what is the nature of bees? What are their limbs, knowledge, senses, virtues, talents, intellect, piety? What is their station? Where are their seats? Their brood, their wings, their coverings, and everyday manner of setting these up everywhere. By thee, marvelling at these light spectacles, mysteries concealed for many centuries are revealed. Butler, either you were counselled by the bees, or it is the wise plan of the bees themselves. He like becomes the voice for bees, doesn't he? So, uh, wonderful old bard of Britain, Rotherham Williamson, once said, a little bit of plagiarism is a little bit of plagiarism, but a lot of plagiarism is research. So, the, so I'm just going to give you lots of quotes from this book. When I had viewed this commonwealth of bees, observed their lives, their art and their degrees, great God Almighty, in thy pretty bee, mine eye, as written in small letters, sees an abstract of that wisdom, power and love, which is imprinted on the heavens above, and praise deserves this author who hath chose so well his times of leisure to dispose. So with this beautiful poem, I'm going by the book later on, or tomorrow, this wonderful poem, again, right at the beginning of the, of the book, by George Wither, uh, first extolling the virtues of bees and then extolling the virtues of the author of the book. Thus doth our author not only thus, but like his bees makes honey too for us. So that the book is honey, his words are honey, and is contended that to help us thrive we should partake the profit of his hive. For which my share I thank him and for those the muses birds, whose nature here he shows, and maugre such as will his pains contemn, the muses thus by me doth do honour them. So he's bringing in the ancient pagan traditions, you know, Virgil, Pliny, Aristotle, completely mixing it with his own uh, Christian pastoral work in humble Hampshire. So chapter one of the nature and properties of bees and their queen. Among all creatures, in respect of their great profit, with small cost of the ubiquity of their small continual labor and comely order, the bees are most to be admired. And then, boom, he throws in the hexameron of St. Ambrose, uh, which is a kind of, was a bit of writing, or eulogy about you know, the, the, the creation and the goes through the seven days. And in one of those days, bees were created. Many uh, philosophers and uh, saints and theologians did similar things in this era. The fruit of the bee is desired by all with complaints. It is not distinguished by the diversity of a person, but is indiscriminate grace sweetens kings as well as commoners. It is not only for pleasure, but also for salvation. So again, right at the beginning of this book, we're seeing apotherapy, we're seeing health, we're seeing vigor, and you know, the continual reparation of, of all things. Not just about the honey harvest, is it? <laughs> and for their order, they may well be said to have a commonwealth, since they all do, all, all they do is in common. And then he's quoting Pliny again. They know nothing but the common. And this one part of the book sort of shouts out in capital letters an express pattern of a perfect monarchy, the most natural and absolute form of government. It's interesting, isn't it? As human beings through the ages, we tend to, when something's mysterious, we tend to look at it through our own filtered lens. A brilliant example is is Silbury Hill in Wiltshire. You know, hundreds of years ago when we were at war with the French, uh, we used to think you know, the folklore was that inside Silbury Hill was a king, King Zell, sitting on a horse, buried on a horse with a sword in his hand, ready to come back and do battle whenever times are hard. Uh, and today, in a kind of modern post-feminist era, you know, the, the folklore and the word on the street is that it's a, it's a sacred mount of the goddess and surrounded by waters and it's a pregnant belly. And so, so, so whatever's happening in culture at the time tends to kind of filter how we view the mysterious. And it was very common in this time, when it, whether the big bee in the middle was a queen or a king or however you considered it, that people would justify um, autocracy, would justify monotheism, would justify... Um, the, the one king and the one leader and, and the one governor. But of course we know today, you know, today we view the bees 
as like that big B in the middle is, is kind of in service to all the others, as if like the secret key or the secret meaning of sovereignty is service. And when you think about the, the monarchy today, when you think about Charles becoming king, the, on the emblem of the Prince of Wales are these three feathers, and beneath that you have this, this uh, uh, little bit of writing in, in German, Ich dien, which is I serve. So there you have it, you know, the kind of, the, it's always been there, this, this true meaning of sovereignty being service, and the, and the mother bee is like in service to all the others, even though she gets away, of course, from time to time. The bee, therefore, excelling in many qualities, evident proofs of the infinite power and wisdom of the Creator. Admire we the all wise omnipotence. So, uh, throughout uh, all considerations of bees throughout history, people have considered them to be wise and all knowing and have come from paradise or the other worlds, <laughs> which doth within so narrow a space dispense, so stiff a sting, so stout and valiant heart, so loud a voice so prudent wit and art. So that's the first chapter, you know, filling us with inspiration and, uh, and knowledge and ancient texts all backing it up and giving us this kind of you know, broad-minded consideration of, of bees and, and how they are and what they are. And then boom, suddenly we're back into the practical knowledge, sound, solid knowledge of, of his work and you know he was a a reverend, so of course he had a lot of time on his hands, <laughs> and he kept a lot of bees. And he's teaching us how to keep them, and how many, this was his preferred way of setting them out in his garden in a meadow at the back of St. Lawrence's in St. Wootton, six feet apart. He preferred to make them sort of slightly egg-shaped. And I had the honor of recreating one recently for the church, in Hampshire, and he agreed with the philosophers that the you know the bees like to hang around in a sphere, which is kind of he's a bit of a hippie, really, Charles Butler, you know, like a, that they hang around in a sphere, and that's the most perfect form. And I've made many hackles before, but it wasn't until I was kind of charged to make a hackle in the style of Charles Butler that I really paid attention to his writing before I just kind of oh yeah, I've made a hackle, I know how to do that, and then suddenly I, I realised that there's a whole new way of making a hackle, that new to me, that he was, he was teaching with this kind of spiral lich on the top that gets soaked and then tucked up underneath. Very, very simple, very easy and quick to make and a lot warmer than hackles I'd made before in a more, in a more contemporary style. And every B-skep needs some splits, some sticks in to brace the comb and to spread the weight of the comb into the walls of the structure. And he talks about a cop and splits. And the cop is a round piece of wood which kind of tucks up uh, in the top, in the, right in the apex of the hive. And the splits are these, as you can see them here, a split piece of wood essentially, or a slit piece of wood, hazel or willow. And then that he's split it most of the way down and put it up into the cop and then it kind of umbrellas out to the walls. And this is a handsome, easy and sure way of splitting. And the capacities were measured in pecks. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. <laughs> a peck is nine litres. And, you know, so he had varying sizes. This was his kind of beginner's size, I suppose. So sort of 17 inches deep by 15 wide and it tapers into 13 underneath. The bees do best defend themselves from cold when they hang around together in the manner of a sphere or globe, which the philosophers account the most perfect figure. And therefore the nearer the hive cometh to the fashioner of, the warmer and safer be the bees. I learnt from Charles Butler about uh, putting strong doorposts into skeps, because the weight of a colony can squash the straw, especially if your door is in the, in the lower section, the lower roll, which is where he liked to put his. Many different ancient bee masters had doors at different places and different styles, and every, everybody did it differently. Had a different style stool, a different type of hackle, different preferred capacity. So Charles Butler's teaching his practice, and he's teaching his practical knowledge and what he prefers. And that's the, that's the summer door, if you like, and, and this is the winter door that slips in. 
kind of not really a mouse god. He would add bits of lead or a bit of horn to protect it from mice. But that would, that's like, like a reduced entrance. At Gemini set the doors wide open and at Virgo set the winter doors and fastened them with the clume. Clume is a composite material like a daub. Could be some subsoil and sand and uh, tempered with a bit of wood ash or lime or could just be simple neat cow dung or neat stung as it was known. And uh, interestingly, cow dung, once it's cured, has antibacterial properties, like a wooden chopping board. You know, if it's not put in a high temperature dishwasher, contain, re retains its natural antibacterial quality to absorb bacteria and it dies within the wood. And lo and behold, cow dung does the same. You think it's a strange thing, isn't it, cow dung, to put it on something you're going to harvest a food product from. It's kind of counterintuitive, but actually, once it's cured, it's really healthy. There's wisdom in the old ways. You know, you look at developing countries still might be plastering their houses with, with cow dung, but there's wisdom in it because um, it's keeping them healthy. I was lecturing somewhere once and a woman uh, put her hand up, hand up and said she grew up in India and once a week they skimmed a new layer of cow dung on the floor of the building she was living in and she loved it because all the fleas jumped on it and got stuck and the flea, you know, she didn't get bitten that day. And again at the entrance you sometimes get like a propolis curtain like this, isn't that amazing? You know, the bees make their own make their own sort of mouse guard where every single bee there is that's being brushed by propolis on the way in, being sort of cleansed at the temple gates going into the, the holy of holies. He talks about seasoning hives with herbs mainly and sometimes mead and sometimes cream and sometimes cow dung of course and then hog saliva which is probably the, the most amusing part of the book. He says, let a hog eat two or three handfuls of malt or peas or other corn in the hive once you've cleaned it all out. Meanwhile, uh, do he so turn the hive that the foam or froth which the hog maketh in eating go all about the hive and so the bees will like this hive better than a new. Like I said, you know, a diabetic pig would be even better. Hackles. With a hackle. A hackle is a strange word, isn't it? It's, it's a, the word comes from the ruffle around a cockerel's neck. So the cockerel's neck feathers. And you can see it's kind of like a cockerel's neck, isn't it? This, this shape. And they say the hackles are up on a dog. You know, the, it's the mane. It's a hackle. So when the hackles are up, it's protecting the hive summer as well as winter. And the best covers are straw. Alveria stramento operari utilifimum. Straw is the most useful cover for the alveari. You can use reeds, water reeds are a bit brittle. And other things, and willow he mentions as well is quite heavy. Straw is like the Rolls Royce of materials for hackles. Let them always be well covered so they'd be safe in summer from heat. I think of the summer we just had. And winter from cold, and at all times from the rain. The weather wasn't much different back then, was it? The Milician year is most fitly measured by astronomical months. Begin with the sun's entrance into several signs of the zodiac and are therefore called by their names. Uh, the sun entering into 12 signs, so beginning that the 12 moneths doth notoriously alter his course, making the days longer or shorter, the air warmer or colder, the earth more fruitful or barren, making also both of the equinoctia and the solstitia. <laughs> so it's surprising, isn't it, being irreverent, you'd think he would have calibrated the year using the Christian calendar. But he used the stars, you know, he used the muses' birds themselves, you know, imprinted on the heavens that were that, uh, are much more accurate, the turning of the stars. In, fact, in the Welsh language, the word for star is seren, and the word for time is amser. And they're both really closely related if you look at the ancient indigenous languages of Britain. Chapter 3 of the breeding of bees and of the drone. The drone, which is a gross hive bee without sting, hath been always reputed to be a greedy lozzle. <laughs> the females have the preeminence. The feminine gender is more worthy than the masculine. <laughs> For albeit he be not seen to engender with the honeybee, either abroad as other insecta do, or within the hive, where you, yet you may by means behold what they do, without doubt is he the male bee which breedeth both honeybeans and drones secretly conceiveth. And, and throughout this chapter, he, you know, he's kind of a, uh, like a 
looking at Aristotle and saying you know, he, he didn't look closely enough, he didn't know what they meant, just because the, he even, you know, even queried, Aristotle queried whether the, the, the worker bees were female because they had a sting and they had a sword and would a female had a sword? You know, so. Chapter five, the swarming of bees and the hiving of them. A brush, a bee brush is a handful of rosemary, hyssop, fennel or, or another herb. Quite often, you know, beekeepers that know a bit of folklore will tell you that a bee brush would be a goose's wing. And Charles Butler says, you know, don't, whatever you do, don't use a feather because the bees can sting the stem of the feather and get their sting stuck in it. And then they keep on repeatedly sting it and sting it and sting it. So he, he wasn't into goose's wings. He was into, you know, the nice soft bit of fennel that you just pluck out the garden and brush the bees off. The manner of hiving is many can hardly be taught by precepts, to be learned by use and experience, and it's different every time, isn't it, when you collect a swarm? It certainly is. Pitchforks come in handy. The signs of after swarms are most certain. These need in some other direction, which the rulers themselves do give by their voices. When the prime swarm is gone, the next prince which he writes as prince, but he means princess and is translated as princess. There was no word for princess in those days. Uh, when she perceiveth a competent number to be fledged and ready, beginneth to tune her treble voice, so that if music were lost, it might be found with the muses' birds. And uh, he talks about insects. You know, bees were classified as insects at this time. And, and at some time, and it's quite... Oh, it's not really known when bees were first, well, I don't know when bees were first classified as insects, but I do know that before they were classified as insects in the medieval era, they were classified as birds. They were just tiny birds. Isn't that great? And then right at the heart of the book, it opens out, and you have this four-part harmony, on well, four pages actually, it opens up twice, and you have this four-part harmony, so four choristers can stand around the book, you know, facing it, and read their part, and uh, it's known as the Minus or Melus, or the Bees Madrigal, and it's onomatopoeic, uh, the sounds of the Queen's piping. I'm not going to sing it for you. <laughs> uh, as of all states, the, this is the first, the first few lines, as of all states, the monarchy is best. So of all monarchies that feminine, of famous Amazons excels the rest, that on this earthy sphere have ever been. You know, how did this kind of amazing art and reverence of, you know, the, the feminine and the Amazonian and woman and queen, you know, just kind of just kind of just emerge from rural Hampshire whilst all around the, the, the kind of known world that the, the, the feminine was being oppressed. It's like this real drop of medicine coming from the bees themselves through Charles Butler, right uh, at the heart of a... Uh, of, uh, of uh, this green and pleasant land, whose little hearts and weaker sex so great a field, no powers of the mightiest males can make to yield. They living I most sober and most chaste, their pain got goods in pleasure scorn to waste. Charles Butler's lyrics. There are many people who've, who've recorded it, but there was a man called Peter Jackson who directed a choir uh, called the, the Choir of, uh, of Little St. Mary's. I'm not going to play you all of it, I'm just going to play you the beginning and then a bit in the middle. Bassus, the bass, and what he calls the, um, the mean, and then the tenor and the contratenor. You know, singing around this small book that they've got open.
Okay, I won't dwell on that for too long. But there you go, there's a, uh, he sat and he listened and he interpreted and he composed lyrics and music uh, for the voice and for, for uh, woodwind instruments to, to kind of show this, this wonderful music and the muses' birds themselves, as he, has, as he said, if music be lost, then it can be found again through the muses' birds of the bee's work. Look at that. This is what he was looking at and listening to. So long as any good flowers grow, even from Pisces or a little before, and to Sagittarius, and some years somewhat after, they lose no time, but follow their business tooth and nail. Love his language. Honey they gather all year, save in those three still months, and is of two sorts. The one pure and liquid, which is called nectar, and the other gross and solid, which, may, which we may by like reason term ambrosia. Yea, rather is the true nectar and ambrosia wherewith Jupiter was first nourished, that the bees were his nurses. And before, a lot of writers that he was reading uh, were calling this, what we know as bee pollen and bee bread, were calling it honey. And he was, you know, just through his you know, tasting and touching and experimenting, he would say, well, this isn't honey. You know, this leg stuff or gross honey, there is a general error for without any scruple or doubt. Men do count it and call it wax. Sorry, they call it wax. And, and did some also in time of old whose opinion, so they thought they were bringing wax home. They didn't realize they had like waistcoat pockets and making wax. But against us all, I shall show you both sense and reason. If you put your tongue, it hath a taste of honey, which wax hath not. If you feel it between your warm fingers, it muttereth apart, where wax sticketh fast together. And if you put it to the fire, it melteth not as wax doth. So just through his beekeeping practice and tasting and touching and he's uh, re-educating the, the known world or anybody that can read. The nectar or liquid honey the bees gather with their tongues whence let it down into their bottles which are within them. Like unto bladders, each of them will hold a drop at once. While it continueth liquid, it will run of itself. It is called live honey. When it's turned white and hard, it is corn honey or stone honey. There's a whole chapter on the enemies of bees. It's quite a small chapter. He talks about the mouse and the woodpecker and the titmouse and, of course, the, uh, the, the emmet, which is the ant. He says, Virgo is the most dangerous time of all, and Libra would be not much better. If you love your bees, suffer not a wasp's nest about you. Can you imagine that uh, reverend telling you that? <laughs> Not any one of these, nor all of these together, do half so much harm to the bees as the bees. Next unto bees, their greatest enemy that the bees have is unkind weather. He talks about the feeding of bees in, uh, and talks about people having you know, ground up bean flowers and malt and rotted wardens and apples and sweet wort and things like that. Of course, this is before refined white sugar. And he talks about feeding the honey and when to feed them and when not to. He talks about the removing of bees. He's not talking about you know, taking bees out of the hive. He's talking about moving bees from place to place. In the fittest time in Libra and the fore part in Scorpio. And or in Aries and the latter part of Pisces. And then chapter 10 of the fruit and the profit of bees wherein is showed uh, first, a vindermiation, which is a term from a, to, that comes from the gathering of grapes or sweet uh, fruit. Think of a vintner. The taking of combs, and secondly, the trying of the wax and honey, and the making of meth or idromel. And thirdly, the singular virtues of them for the use and comfort of man. And uh, this is where, when I will go and meet someone or talk to a club or go somewhere and people say, and I'll talk about skeps and skep beekeeping, and I say, well, you, you can't really do that this day and age, can you? Because you have to kill the bees to harvest the honey. And it's just not true, you know. It, it, he talks about the taking of the combs by killing the bees, by lighting a packet of sulfur or smoking the bees and, and a fumigation to um, suffocate them and how some people might uh, drown them and how that was a a surefire way of you know, 
killing all the bees in 15 minutes and getting a, an easy way of getting the honey out. But it was never the only way, and he talked about the other ways of to taking, the, taking out the... Because when people tell me, well, how do you get honey out of a skep? I just say, well, you just cut it out with a knife. You know? It's as simple as that. You have brood in the middle and pollen on the edges and, and the honey comes on the outside, just like a conventional hive you know, or, or a wild colony. But it's how you get the bees out of the way, which is <laughs> the hard bit. And, uh, so they're driving the bees. I'm sure most of you have heard about driving the bees when you upturn a skep, and he talks about doing it at midsummer. he talks about doing it in the spring and doing it later in the year. And you can see he's got a lot of respect for keeping bees alive when he talks about this, and uniting colonies and making the best of what you've got, even though his preferred method was killing the bees. But you saw from that very early picture of his apiary, you know, he had about 60-odd hives humming away there, and this was before human rights, let alone animal rights. And I think just like a coppicer coppicing a woodland, he must have viewed the, the, the apiary, the, the bees, a bit like you know, a coppicer saying, well, if I cut a bit here, and a st you know, he even called them stools, like a coppice stool. You know, so this one's on a stool. If I coppice that one and cull that one and cull that one and cull that one, next year they're just all going to come springing back, and nature is this irrepressible force that restores itself. <laughs> and, uh, so and he's probably had in the back of his mind there's a few less swarms to deal with next year as well. You know, and you're making room, he's making room, and it's kind of disease management in a way too. But he, he talks about driving the bees. You turn them upside down and you, you pat them. And you drum them and it takes about half an hour. You turn the, the colony up. And he would then place another hive on top and have a piece of material around so there's no gap. But in more recent history, driving the bees, you'd have a gap and you'd have driving eyes to be able to see what was happening so that uh, you, could, you could spot the queen and other things. And it was, you know, it was like plowing matches and shin kicking. It became a kind of you know, countryside activity at certain fairs and festivals and, and club meetings. Uh, David Charles was a great sort of uh, exponent of driving the bees and other uh, beekeepers that are no longer with us. And, uh, and I teach it once a year through Bees for Development. We run a skep beekeeping course and you can come and, and learn all about skep beekeeping at my apiary and get hands on with driving the bees. And it's absolutely fascinating. Their, their natural instinct in a state of emergency, they're upside down. And so the combs, are, uh, you know, the larvae are slowly dripping out, the eggs are slowly falling out and any nectar's dripping out. They, they go down, there's a bit of chaos for about a minute. And then they all start to re-emerge and you're drumming them. And then they just all orderly fashion, you know, they calm down and a few make it to that skep, that kind of lifeboat situation that you've provided for them and start fanning. And then they behave a bit like a swarm, you know, and they've all filled themselves up with honey and they do, you keep drumming and they just all walk upwards. It's magic, it's wonderful. And then you can sing to them and just watch them and watch the queen go up. And there are various ways where you can stop or drive all of them. It's a wonderful thing. I mean, I'm sure the, the bees aren't really going to thank you for it that much, but it's a wonderful process. Once they all calm down, it's really quite an enchanting and magical process for that to happen. And then when all the bees are out, you can do whatever you want with the hive. And uh, if you've never done it, it it's really is something. And he talks about exsection or castration as a third kind of taking, and that's when you wouldn't drive the bees out. You would just take the side combs and brush them off with a nice bit of hyssop or fennel, but not a, not a goose's wing. <laughs> uh, and this is another kind of a bit of the book that made me laugh. If the weather being not warm, you find some bees chilled about the hive, fill your warm hands full of them and, and are known they will fly away to their fellows. And if it haply any chance to prick you, which they will seldom do, your hand will have the more virtue to revive the rest because it'll be throbbing and, and a lot warmer. <laughs> so he had a sense of humour as well, didn't he? And here he is, uh, celebrated brilliantly at St. Lawrence's Church in Wharton, St. Lawrence, where he, he became uh, the reverend uh, until the end of his life. And uh, last year we had a pilot event there, a bee fair to celebrate him and this year coming up on the 19th and 20th of August we have another event to celebrate the the, the 400th anniversary the quad centenary of the 1623 edition of the feminine monarchy and there he is holding 
the book in, in his left hand and holding a, a silver chalice in his right hand. And here's Ben Coutzer, the, the current, excuse me, reverend, uh, with the silver chalice itself. If all is true, that is not a lie. This is the very same chalice that, uh, that he's holding. You can see in the window there. And he loves the fact, you know, he loves the history. He's American and he loves the history and he loves uh, people coming and, and taking interest and coming to see the window. And of course, he'll also be speaking at the B Fair this year. And there'll be stalls and speakers and performances and activities and tree planting. And most magnificently, Stile Antico, this is like a, a, a choir of like 11 or 12 people, will be singing live the Melissa Melos in the church on the Saturday and the Sunday. So it's going to be very special. I know it's, a four, it's only a four-part harmony, but, uh, but you know, I think uh, they'll be singing other things as well. There'll be an international beekeepers forum. So the, Charles Butler is the father of English beekeeping and the father of uh, European beekeeping, Anton Jansa. Uh, was uh, a few years back by, a, by the Slovenian uh, president of, of the Slovenian Beekeeping Association who took uh, uh, steps to inaugurate the World Bee Day on the 20th of May. Did that because of uh, Anton Jasna's birthday, birthday on the 20th of May. So he's going to be coming to the Bee Fair. So you have that lovely sort of uh, link between the father of European beekeeping and the father of English beekeeping. And there'll be a Hive Education Centre. And, uh, and I'll be there. And there'll be much wonderful things happening. Do come along to, to Hampshire, Wooten St. Lawrence. It's not far from Basingstoke. And then, as I mentioned earlier, he went on in 1634 to, uh, to rewrite the feminine monarchy, uh, dedicated to, to Henrietta Maria of France, the Queen Consort uh, to Charles I. So there's an interesting, you know, here we have the, another Charles and another Queen Consort, or, or Queen as she's now known, happening. There's an interesting sort of 400 year uh, sort of cycle happening, isn't there, somehow? And, and I haven't read this version, but uh, it's the one that's, I think, most difficult to read because he's written it in a, in a way, you know, in, with his language reformist hat on. <laughs> and he, uh, I guess it's, if he got his way, our, our language and the way it's written would have been much different and we'd just be used to it. Well, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, that was great. Thank you, Chris. Um, if you've been inspired to read it, uh, you can go to Northern Bee Books and Jerry will happily send, sell you a book of the latest edition translated by Joel, John Owen, which is very readable and interesting. I noticed there he's also got a facsimile of the first edition, which he'll sell you for 100 quid. Or if you've got a bit of loose change, I did recently see a second edition um, for sale online for about £40,000. <laughs> yeah. So any questions, anyway? Uh, yeah, yes. Before asking two questions, I must first of all say, Chris, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, my two questions, firstly, have you ever used the saliva of a hog <laughs> on a hive? And the second question, if not, uh, will you tell us when you're going to do it? <laughs> uh, no and yes. <laughs> More female aspects of things, but what about the female um, raising of, of, of bees? Because that was often a very feminine thing to do, wasn't it, within the household? So, that's a great question. That's a whole. There's a whole book there, isn't there, about how um, about female beekeepers, and uh, let me, where can I come from there? So, some of I mean, some of the most ancient texts we have on beekeeping uh, from ancient Egypt, and one of them is a papyrus of a, of a, a woman petitioning uh, for legal help because her hives didn't get brought back up on donkeys from the flood. And whether she was the beekeeper or the owner of the bees is not clear. Most honey hunters that we know are male in the world still today. Most honey hunting traditions 
it's a, it's a man's world hunting because you know we're dispensable. So if we fall up the tree, it doesn't matter really. You know, if it, it only takes one man in the village, doesn't it, to keep it going? And and, uh, <laughs> and, and but 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 saying that Eva Crane, I'm going into prehistory now, but Eva Crane interprets the the famous uh, rock art in Valencia of the Cave of the Spiders as a woman climbing that rope simply because she's got big thighs. But I think that's viewed through her feminist filter. And so, so saying that, I think beekeeping obviously uh, evolved from honey hunting. So I think early on it was probably a male-dominated world. And in Charles Butler's time, there's not much evidence for women keeping bees. There's evidence a bit of some of it. And so I don't know the answer to your question. I do know that in the 1880s in America, there was a really big push uh, through publications to encourage women beekeeping. And that's where, where you see a lot of women beekeepers suddenly doing it uh, in their own right. Before that, it was like, um, like, like Huber's wife, you know, like a, like a lot of famous bee scientists and beekeepers' wives were helping and became known through helping their husbands. But it wasn't until like the 1880s in America where you, where you see uh, women beekeepers in their own right doing it as a person who's not helping a man. They're just doing it because they, they've been taught to and educated to. Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole other lecture there, isn't there, I think. Thanks for a fascinating uh, talk, Chris. Absolutely wonderful. Tell me, how easily do those uh, hives with hackles on blow over? Do you have to do anything to stop it? Yes, you do at the beginning. Before the, before the weight of the colony keeps it on the stool, he talks about, you know, and I, and I do it too, you can, you can lash it on with, um, with bits of string going underneath his stool or hanging like stones with holes in, you know, hag stones, bits of flint and things like that. And he also talks about having some forked sticks to brace them against the wind, you know, sort of stuck into the ground on the, on the leeward side and things like that. So there are all sorts of, yeah, it's all in there, get the book and, and learn. It's a wonderful book, you know, not, not just the, the, the fact that it teaches us about beekeeping, the way it's written and the, the poetry and the, the, the mythology all sort of interwoven through it with the practical knowledge and just his, his flair and the way he writes. Is, I love it. Hi, Chris. Does, um, is there a cosmic view of swarming that he came up with? A cosmic view of swarming? <laughs> well, I mean, first of all, you have to define your terms. What do you mean by cosmic? Does he see the process of swarming in a, an interesting light through, as you've described it, astronomical? Right. I would say uh, he's alluding to astronomy all the way through. He's alluding to the birds of the muses and these ancient pagan belief systems about bees that he just keeps on bringing up and keeps on quoting all the way through. And he talks about uh, being in, you know, the bees being imprinted upon the heavens and the muses both a constellation of, of uh, uh, the Pleiades is known as the muses birds as well you know that small little cluster on the hip of the constellation of Taurus and he's, of course he's using the zodiac and, the, and all, the, all the, the signs of the twelve houses so he, all the time just through his language if, if you've got eyes to see it and, and ears to hear it, you can, he's, he's kind of teaching this more, slightly more cosmic... He was a hippie, you know, it seems like he was a, I don't know, you could, I'm viewing him through my lens now, I think he was, a, he was, a, he was like a druidic um, character, and unshackled from the church somehow, but also very pious and very um, Christian, but he's inspired, you can see he's inspired by this more ancient taproot cosmic be law. It's all in there if you've got the eyes to see it. Thanks again very much for your talk, very, much, very enjoyable. I'm just thinking, reflecting on, here we are at the Spring Convention, in Charles Butler's day, was he a, a bestseller? Did beekeepers get together and have, have chair experiences, or was it really just a solitary, you did your own thing and you didn't learn from anyone else? I don't know. I have no idea. It's very hard to find. But what, uh, what I do know is when he published The Feminine Monarchy in 1609, he didn't expect, really expect anyone to read it. You know, the small little publication scrawled away in Oxford somewhere, and he really didn't expect anyone to read it. But then, in 1623, you know, 
became so much bigger and so much better and, and, and he, I guess he became more well known and he dedicated a lot of his life to it and you can see that in the book and he just became really prolific in that era he was, wasn't just, he was writing other books too so once he got into the publishing habit and the publishing behaviour you can see that he was, really, he was really playing to his audience but I don't know if they, how they got together and how they met and, and a well messenger might know he's a few rows behind you <laughs> One of my uh, heroes is Richard Remnant. Uh, one day I'll write him up and everybody will know about him. But he came before Butler and those early books, there weren't many, but I think what was happening was that probably centred on the universities and some religious establishments, and of course in places like Oxford those were virtually synonymous, then there would have been an exchange of information. There would have been reference to those books. And so there was, if you like, a beekeeping community, but it was a very long time before you had anything like a beekeeping association. Yeah, so it's like you, you, you learn from your neighbours, I suppose, and and yeah, he, he was still in touch. He was a clergyman, so he would have been, there would have been a, a religious community that he was part of. And other, as, we, as I'm sure you're aware, many reverends were beekeepers. And you know, the, 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 to do with the, the, you know, the, the profit and the business and the wax and the honey and all things. And, and, uh, and the medicine involved. But uh, yes, he was, he was a scholar in Oxford, so he certainly would have kept those, those connections. And once the publishers, and I guess it's a two-way thing, once the publishers knew him, they were you know, encouraging him to get his work out. Then it was a time when publishing was really taking off as well, and was sort of changing the world, and people were realizing how it, would, how it could reach people. Just one more. Um, is there any indication how much of a stir he caused when he called Rex the Queen? I can imagine it was a little bit akin to calling the Earth round. <laughs> uh, I haven't seen any evidence of any kind of a stir, but he does mention at the beginning of the book, you know, he says, I don't mean to be rude, I don't mean to offend anyone, you know, when he does say, you know, she's the Queen. But he's, he's a lot of the writers that he's sort of uh, disclaiming, you know, were, were uh, dead a long time. <laughs> dead a long time, you know, like uh, like Pliny and Aristotle and Virgil and um, Ambrose, and you know, so that, that was, he. I guess what what he. Some people that might have been offended were the ones that were just repeating that parrot fashion without actually having any knowledge of how Beehive worked. So I think he'd, people, there were, I don't think there were any, any, I don't think there was anyone there to kind of really argue with him. I don't, I don't think that was happening. And that's just academically it was called a Rex, you know, and perhaps behaviorally, you know, every beekeeper before then probably might have known it was a mother, you know, because they were looking and, and, and just, so you've got, you've got like the grassroots mutterings amongst the beekeepers and you've got what the what you know Aristotle and Pliny are saying you know I think they're completely different things thank you well thank you very much Chris and thank you for a fascinating talk I'm glad it was so interesting because after that mead I was feeling a little bit mellow and relaxed I could have had a bit of a snooze I think but luckily you kept me awake it was really fascinating so everybody please join me once again in thanking Chris for his fascinating talk <laughs>